If you're interested in spiritism, its underlying conceptualization of magic, and the possible influence on Satanism, stay tuned, because you're just about to find out a specific spiritist, an Italian spiritist, that had a very interesting con concept of magic. Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Angela Puca and welcome to my symposium. I'm a PhD and a university lecturer and this is your online resource for the academic study of magic, paganism, shamanism, satanism and uh, spiritism apparently and all things occult. This video is going to be um, the recording from the paper, the conference paper I gave at the conference of the European Association for the Study of Religions, uh, which was held at the University of Pisa. I was in the panel of um, esotericism. Actually, the theme of the conference is resilient religions, and our panel was on resilient esotericism. And the paper is going to be on, on a specific medium called Fulvio Rendel. And uh, yeah, I hope you, you enjoy it and stay tuned until the end. Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Angela Puca, as I was, um, now I was introduced by Manon. And first off, thank you everybody for being here. And thank you uh, to Marco and Eric to, for putting together this a uh, very fascinating set of panels on esotericism. As you know, the conference theme is resilient religion, but now we are talking about resilient esotericism. <laughs> and more specifically, in the case of my paper, I will be talking about uh, one spiritist called Fulvio Rendel and the survival and adaptation of spiritism in Italy. So, uh, he is a spiritist, but we will see that um, the matter is complex and he has had an interesting influence on the uh, Italian esoteric milieu. So first off, let's clarify terminology. So uh, spiritism, spiritualism and the Italian spiritismo, which is obviously the one that I'm talking about, but uh, being the conference in English, I'm going to use the word Spiritism. So, spiritism uh, is the French term often translated by English speakers as spiritualism. And in French, the term spiritualism um, is a philosophical term referring to the belief that the human spirit or soul exists, as opposed to materialism, which denies the existence of the spirit. I use the English spiritism to distinguish the movement from a more general use of spiritualism. The Italian term I'm translating by spiritism is spiritismo. So now a few precursors of the spiritism, including the Italian spiritism. The first one being uh, Franz Anton, Anton uh, Mesmer. And uh, because he talked about and he conceptualized the idea of animal magnetism, and uh, also he talked about uh, mesmer mesmerizing and uh, this concept was also uh, found in patients which were mesmerized and by being mesmerized they would get they would often get in contact with the spirits of the dead so that's quite interesting because it is um, a bit of a precursory uh, towards the idea of spiritism. Then another key moment in history was that from the Fox sisters. The Fox sisters are quite interesting because uh, they, you know, the main events around them uh, are from the mid 18th century. And they saw spirits manifesting in their house and elaborated, and that's, I guess, the, the interesting thing. That they elaborated a system to communicate with these spirits that were appearing. So it wasn't just the spirits appearing, but also that they developed a system to communicate with these spirits. And it was a system of uh, wrappings. So it's like, you know, uh, you have one for 
uh, yes and two for a no and they had a system to communicate in that way. And so that was a, uh, an interesting moment because it determined, uh, you know, the, it kind of uh, set the stage for the idea that you can communicate, you can create a system to communicate with the spirits. And then we have Alan Kardec, and uh, he's the father of spiritism as a system with its own philosophy. So you, you have a systematized understanding of spiritism uh, since Alan Kardec. So I'd say that these three are the three main precursors. There are different attitudes towards spiritism. You have a religious one, which is less common, and it is related to religion or religious figures uh, more specifically or linked to a specific religion. It is embedded in a specific religion, but that is very uncommon. Uh, the most popular form of spiritism is, the, is a secular one. And it is associated, it, became, it got associated in the late 19th century and early 20th century um, with political revolutions. Uh, so, for instance, we have the notorious case of Giuseppe Garibaldi, who was um, also a leading figure of the unification of Italy. And uh, this secular spiritism is also associated with this rebellious attitude towards the dominant religion and the dominant culture. <clears throat> now, on to Fulvio Rende. One thing that is quite interesting is that during the period between the two world wars, we see that there is a, sort of an interruption in the interest and practice of spiritism. And then it is, just, it is after that, in the 1970s, that um, in Italy you start having spiritism again. You start seeing that again, and one of the main figures that we find in these years is Fulvio Rende. He was born in Rome around the 1930s. Um, I don't know exactly his date of birth. He, he tends to be very proud about it, but um, we know that he is uh, in his 90s. I know because I conducted interviews with um, one of his disciples, which I'm going to cover later in the paper. So he was the founder of the spiritic circle Navona 2000, uh, which is called like that because um, it, was, it, took, it, it used to take place in Piazza Navona in Rome. And it was founded in, the, in 1969. And uh, it, went, it went on for quite a long time. And one of the main um, one of the main traits of this spirit, spiritic circle was that it was open to everyone, and so that meant that everybody could go there and, um, you know, experience the contact with spirits, or, or rather, to see Fulgurende and other mediums there to interact, with how they would interact with spirits. He is author of several books on the theoretical understanding of magic, high magic, and spirit evocation. So, he is famous for the evocation in 1973, uh, 100 years uh, after its first appearance of the ghost of the so-called Katie King, evolved in London uh, in, the so in the 19th century by the medium Florence Cook in the presence of the scientist William Coates. He's always been keen on being tested, so he got, uh, you know, lie detector tests and uh, photograph, he got photographed um, and filmed. Uh, there are lots of these things that you can also find quite easily online as well to show that he wasn't deceiving people. So there is something that he kind of remarked a lot. Similarly to Arthur Conan Doyle, he deems spiritism akin to science in that you can prove through experience instead of relying on faith. And this is actually one of the interesting aspects of Rendell's spiritism, this idea, this connection to science. And I'd say that uh, by reading, reading his books and uh, talking to, to his disciple and all the research that I did for this paper, what emerges is that it is an interesting 
perhaps some ambivalent um, relation to science, because on one hand, in terms of methodology, there is a, a search for a scientific or a science-like methodology in order to prove that spiritism and the con contact with spirits is something that is factual, that is real. Uh, but equally, uh, he also acknowledges that science has its limits and uh, it's not like he's claiming that spiritism uh, can be fully explained or fully proven by science. Uh, however, the methodology provided by science is considered quite valuable uh, as because spiritism doesn't really rely on faith. So, spiritism um, for Randall is not really the core of his system, even though he got famous, he became famous uh, because of his spiritic practices. What he was really about was magic and its conceptualization. So these aspects were actually more important to him than the actual practice of spiritism. In fact, he doesn't, he even prefers the terms mediumship over the term spiritism to describe what he does. Um, and in this case, mediumship translates the Italian medialità, and that's the term that he prefers over spiritism. He sees himself more as a magician, a mago, rather than a spiritist. And he's always, because he's always retained control over spirit possessions. So it, it wasn't like he lost control during the, you know, all the different experiences that he had with spirits, but he would always retain control. Um, and also magic is seen as a science, as I mentioned, that involves the self, the being, and the transformative relations between them. There is also a secular view of the magical endeavors, including spiritism, where the manifested phenomena and experiences prevail over religious beliefs. So in this case, you, can, you, you have kind of a phenomenological approach, so you have this idea that the, the experiences come first and then the beliefs come after. So it's more like theory comes as a result of what you experience, rather than experiencing experiences having to match a specific theoretical framework or a specific belief system. Now let's see the Randall system of magic. So this is a, an image uh, taken from one of his books, and, he rep and this represents magic, according to him. So magic doesn't need deities, as every person is a god, and so for this reason, magic is not dependent on the religion, according to him. Magic is symbolized by triad. Science has a positive pole, which is create, creation, destruction, and even though it, it, you know, it leads more towards the creation side, he argues that uh, everything has a bit of its opposite within it. So uh, even, though it, uh, even though science is a creative force, it also contains a destructive element. Mm -hmm. And so art is the, is the negative pole, which is a creative destruction, and here by art he means imagination, the, uh, the imagination that uh, the magician has to have uh, in his or her practice. And this is the negative pole, and as you can see, it's associated with the symbol of the moon, whereas science is associated with the symbol of the sun. And it is a creative instruction linked to the death, life, death circle. And then we have the cosmic religion here, as a pole of synthesis that overcomes cause and effect. So one thing that he says quite often is that one of the things that are altered completely during the magical act, including spiritism, is the relation between time, space, and logic. So these are the three elements that get altered in the magical state and during the magical practice. So, and here, as you can see, so you have Mercury representing the cosmic religion, and then you have the two, these, these are meant to be the two zeros which become the infinite because it's like the combination of 
plus and uh, minus, and it becomes uh, one zero here and the other zero here, and that is the, the infinite. Because that's how human beings can reach the way in the infinite. So he distinguishes between high magic and low magic, favoring the first. So for him, spiritism is part of high magic. But as I said, actually, spiritism is part of his magical system rather than being the center of his practice. Um, and he favors high magic. Uh, magic, according to him, predates religion. It's trans-religious, so you can find it across religions, and it comes before every religion. And goes beyond institutionalized religions as well. So there is a, a relation between magic and religion, but it's not like magic has to be part of religion. He criticizes those authors that argue that um, magic is um, part of a necessarily part of a religious system. That magic needs a religious uh, setting. So he he thinks that there is a religious component to magic, but that is more like magic is the source that contains the religious element rather than the other way around. Um, also, magic has no dogma as it's based on and adjusts to what reason and uh, an analytic, uh, analytical study of experience suggests. And also the ritual, as I was mentioning earlier, uh, alters the triad of space, time, and logic experienced in non-ritualistic settings. So you have this, you know, you, you have the ordinary state where we follow certain rules of time, space, and logic, and then in the magical state, those three get altered. Also, magic works with the opposite poles. Uh, which are considered to be uh, poles or conductors. He theorizes a lot, when it comes to magic, he theorizes a lot about these different forces which are um, of a binary nature, but then they uh, interact and they get uh, synthesized. So magic works with, oh, with the opposite poles or conductors and the uh, and neutral ones, which hold the, transform the transformative power represented by the synthesis. Also, the self is composed by the I, the anti-I, and the synthetic I. So this idea of magic is also applied to the idea of the self, because the magician, as the person engaging with the magical practice, is also part of this, um, you know, this cosmology. Although, as I said, um, this system, the theoretical system, is based on his experiences. Uh, for instance, one of the things that the I is the, the self that we project outwards, the one that we know and we experience materially. The anti-I is the part of ourselves that can um, engage with spirit communication. So, for instance, he writes that uh, when the ectoplasm uh, takes shape, it is because it is using the anti-I of the magician. So it's kind of borrowing part of the substance of the medium in order to take shape and take material form. And then the synthetic eye is the mixture of the two, and when this synthesis occurs, the magician is, you know, a full, a full formed uh, human being and a full formed magician. Uh, so, and this is the, how also it is uh, represented in, in graphic form. Um, and yeah, he also distinguishes between uh, the B and the pink. It's difficult to translate, but um, and there is this dynamism that also involves the, the self. Also, the evocation works by acting on the ego to manifest a being. So, uh, like here, like we see here in the, in the image. So we have from the entity as the universal, then the being particular, objective, and mutable. And you have the dynamism leading to existing by means of reason, and then you have the ego, which is general, subjective, and stable. So there is this dynamism between these opposing forces, between the universals and the particulars, and the objective and the subjective. And these are all part of. Um, sometimes he has called this whole process an illusion, uh, not because he 
uh, deems that magical practices are real, but because uh, all of the everything that we see is to a certain extent a form of illusion. Now this is the, the, the person that I interviewed. Uh, her name is Asifio Oscura, and she's a Satanist and um, one of Randall's disciples. Uh, she was born in 1990, 1992 and lives in Rome. And um, it's interesting because she, um, she and I had, a, had an interview regarding Randall and how his form of spiritism and his conceptualization of magic revealed to me revealed to be influence in um, to, to have an influence on the contemporary occult occultic milieu. And he said she said that uh, Randall is first and foremost a magician, which we clarified earlier as well. Uh, he's being called a Satanist, but uh, he isn't one and this comes from a Satanist. Uh, so uh, although Satan has been revalued by him in recent years, but I'm not going too much into it because I don't have time. Uh, Randall's work has been indirectly influential on contemporary Satanism, and that is in Hasifa's words, uh, because um, as for the link between Spiritism and Satanism, I believe the connecting link is the concept of occultism. Occultism was born with the advent of Spiritism, and modern Satanism was born with occultism. Spiritism cannot be reduced to communicating with the dead as it entails a dialogue with other spirits such as demons, deities, and so on. It's not a coincidence that one of the best known definitions of Satanism is occultist Satanism. Personally, I see a rather obvious connection. Mediumship, in general, is a fundamental trait in Satanism since it is based precisely on the communication with entities. I do not mean, of course, that Spiritism is a form of Satanism, but rather that Satanism uses spiritual practice by concentrating it purely in the direction of certain entities of worship. So, how is uh, private Spiritism resilient then? So, as the title of his book suggests, it's not Spiritism as much as it's Spiritic magic. So, Randall made working with spirits accessible to anyone uh, at a time. Well, first off, he uh, allowed for the revival of spiritism to occur after the interruption of the, uh, you know, between the, the period of, of two world wars. Um, and then he also made the communication with spirits accessible to anyone because everybody could uh, really go and attend his spiritic circle. Also, he created a complex system of magic based on Hermetic and Renaissance philosophy, uh, which um, with influences from 18th and 19th century French occultism, and his transreligious and magic-centered system has been influential for other traditions as well, because um, it gave, uh, you know, you have different traditions in Italy that engage with some kind of magic, but they usually have some religious connotation, like with paganism or Wicca and uh, other such forms of traditions. Whereas with um, this form of spiritism, it kind of provides uh, theoretical and practical tools and a toolkit for those who want to engage with spirit communication but don't want to, um, you know, uh, get the, the, relig the religious component that you find in other traditions that also engage with magic. And so, um, yeah, it would be fascinating to explore it further, especially in relation to a contemporary uh, modern Satanism, uh, because it seems that there is more to be found there. Thank you so much for listening. to reach out to me, these are my contact details and my YouTube channel which is on the academic knowledge of these topics. So, this is it for today's video. Hope you liked it. If you like my work and want me to keep the academic fund going, please consider supporting me with a one-off PayPal donation by pledging on my Patreon, aka my inner symposium, where you will get access to lots of different perks depending on your chosen tier. Or you could also join memberships 
as all of these things really helped me to keep this project going and allow me to produce more content for you guys. And otherwise, even by sharing and commenting and liking my videos, you're really helping this community grow. So I also thank you if you do that. In fact, if you did like this video, don't forget to smash the like button, <laughs> subscribe to the channel, activate the notification bell so that you will never miss a new upload from me, and stay tuned for all the academic fun. Bye for now.